I was having uh, lunch with my, my buddy Rick this week, and he reminded me of a statement that uh, in, in terms of this series called The Bridge, of course, it's a statement that I've never said to anybody. Maybe you have said, some, said this to somebody before, but not me. The statement, well, you can just build a bridge and get over it. Anybody ever said that before? I've never said that. What do you, my wife's saying, I mean, I'm, I've never said that. So I figured, why not call this next message, build a bridge and dot, 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 dot. So thank you for that, Rick. Greatly appreciate that. Let me open with this quote that I found this week. I can't remember who said it, but I like it. He who asked a question is a fool for five minutes. He who does not ask a question remains a fool forever. You've heard that statement, there are no dumb questions. But when you have small kids like I do, you, sometimes you feel like maybe there is. <laughs> it's just hard, you know. And they like to ask a lot of what if questions, right? Daddy, what if this happened? Or what if, what if, what if? And the reality is we ask a lot of what if questions too in our own minds. So I found some funny what if questions I figured I would try out on you this morning. Is that okay? So I, I'm curious to see how you respond to these. What if you had a job that pays you half a million dollars a month for sitting in a pitch black house for eight hours a day? Would you take it? Who would take it? Raise your hand. Some people, but we're about 50-50, aren't we? 50-50? What if you had to give up one thing between your phone or your vehicle? Who says I give up my phone? Who says I give up my vehicle? Anybody? It's just a few. Some of you are like, I don't want to admit it, but I would give up my vehicle because I can use Uber. We, listen, there ain't no Uber in Tyler County, okay? <laughs> Uber ain't happening here. I don't know what it's called. Somebody's come up with a redneck version of Uber. It'd be diesels and all that kind of stuff, right? Tractors. Who's just starting? I'm, a, I'm starting that today. When I get home, what are we going to call it? Anybody? Yeah. Next question. What if you had to live in either the Sahara Desert or in Antarctica? Which one would you pick? Who says Sahara? Oh, that's basically where we already live almost. I mean, Antarctica, anybody? Cold? About, about split. What if you could only listen to one singer or band for the rest of your life? Who would you pick? George Jones. That ain't a bad option. CCR, Creed's Clearwater Revival. That's a pretty good pick. You need Jesus, Woody. Good thing you're here today. Hey, listen, here, here's the key question for us this morning. What if the book of your life ended right now? Would it be a good story? Would it be a good story? Would it be a story worth telling what if I told you you had some control over that? We like control, don't we? You know, when we think about the Bible, much of the Bible is God using either bad or challenging situations in people's lives to bring about greater good in their stories later. It is, isn't it? What, what if Daniel was just thrown into the lion's den and the story ends? Not a very good story, is it? What if Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were just thrown into the fiery furnace and, then, and that was all we were left with? The story ended. What if Job just lost everything and the book of his life was closed and there was no restoration that God, God did in his life? What if Noah had just built a boat and people just thought he was a crazy old man and that was it? What if Jesus just died, which is not a good thing in and of itself, right? And that was it. He, he didn't rise again. What, what, what if, what if, what if, the, what, what about the disciples if that had happened? Who gave up so much to follow Jesus and he dies and then that's the end. What if, what if God didn't send Jesus? What if that was the end of the story? What if the parts of our stories that we would just assume leave out 
are the very parts that God wants to use to bring about the biggest victory, the greatest story ever told. What if? I came across an old proverb, an old story. It's not, not from the Bible, but just an interesting story. Follow me here. A farmer gets a horse, which soon runs away. A neighbor says, well, that's bad news. The farmer replies, good news, bad news. Who can say? The horse comes back and brings another horse with him. Good news, you might say. The farmer gives a second horse to his son who rides it and then is thrown from it and badly breaks his leg. So sorry for your bad news, says the concerned neighbor. Good news, bad news. Who can say, the farmer replies. In a week or so, the army comes and takes every able-bodied young man to fight in a war. The farmer's son is spared because of his broken leg. Good news, bad news. Who could say? To, to me, this story is not looking about, it's, it's not about looking on the bright side or just waiting to see how things turn out. It's about how quick we are to want to label a situation good or bad. But the reality is, every situation in our life, the story of our life, the book of our life is an evolving or a developing situation. And good or bad are often incomplete stories that we tell ourselves. For some of us, that's where we are in life right now. As we think about our autobiographies and our personal stories, there are maybe things that have happened to us or things that we have gone through over the years. Truth be told, right now, if we look at that situation, we would see that as a bad thing. There's a guy in the Bible by the name of Joseph. Not Joseph, Jesus' father, but Joseph back in the Old Testament. And Joseph was a son of Jacob. And he was Jacob's favorite. And Joseph had a lot of other brothers that were jealous of that. Joseph didn't help matters. He was a little bit braggadocious. And so his brothers concocted a plan to sell him off into slavery. And so Joseph goes through this crazy, crazy, crazy life full of ups and downs, good and bad things, till finally one day God races him to basically number two over all of Egypt. And if you know the story, a famine occurs, and none other than Joseph's brothers show back up in need of grain, in need of help, in need of food to be able to survive. And Joseph is the very person who sits in the place, who sits in the chair to be able to give them what they need. At first, they don't recognize him. And Joseph has a little fun with them and maybe scares them a little bit. But in that moment, Joseph has a minute of perspective. He realizes what God was doing. He realizes that through all the bad, even some of the good, God was always at work. And he says this thing in Genesis 50, verse 20, that just blows my mind. As he encounters his brothers, and his brothers realize who he is. Scared for their life. Now this brother that they had sold off into slavery has every power to do away with them and kill them. Shaking in their boots. Joseph looks at his brothers and says this. You intended harm to me. But God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so that I could save the lives of many people. Good news bad news. Good news, right? What a statement. Question. What if the book of your life ended right now? Would it be a good story? Would it be a story worth telling? If you're here today, let's agree on this. You're alive, you're breathing. Thank God, God's given you that ability. Your story is incomplete. How many of you, from time to time, got that on your report card when you were growing up? Got that I? I don't really know what to think about that. Is that a good thing? I don't even know what that means. Does that mean you can go back later and, and, and fix it? And I don't know. Your story is incomplete. What if I just stopped preaching right now and left this message incomplete? (laughs) 
That was awkward. Just thought I would try it. Some people say, you know, I don't really have a, a good story to share about myself. In the Christian world, we'd call that story a testimony. You guys have heard that word if you've been around for any amount of time. I, I don't really have a, a testimony. Just so we're clear, here, here's what a testimony is. It's the revealed truth about what Jesus did in your life, in a life, in my life. Revealed means you can see it. It's a visible change, a noticeable difference in your lifestyle or in a relationship. That's a testimony. We've all heard the amazing stories of life change. People delivered from addiction, relationships restored after significant betrayal, even miraculous stories of people in bad health being healed or others being given a second chance after a significant accident. And you might be like, like I used to, thinking, well, I, I have a story, but it's not a good one. And the typical response in church when you say that would be this, well, sure you have a testimony. If you have Jesus in your life, You've got a testimony, and that's true to an extent. But the reality is this. I came to the conclusion somewhere around the age of 10 to invite Jesus Christ in my life. Thank God. But I knew nothing of the hardships of life. I didn't. I couldn't comprehend those things. I didn't know how to express them. I, haven't, I hadn't lived enough. So in that sense, I had an incomplete story. I had a testimony, but not a very interesting one, or a very good one. But like all of you, especially in these last couple of years, let me tell you something, I've been through some junk. I've been through some stuff. We all have. And I just can't be quiet because now I have a testimony worth sharing. As I experienced major anxiety and major panic attacks and even depression in the last summer, and God has brought me through that. I'm not ever going to shut up about that. I find myself weekly almost sharing and talking about that with other people. There was a time when I was ashamed of the fact that I have Tourette's syndrome. And I wouldn't talk about that. And I would act like it really wasn't there. But everybody else sees it. But today, I'll walk in that because that's a victory. Because I'm not supposed to be up here on this stage talking to you. God could use anybody else. He shouldn't use me. Now I've got a story to tell. It was always there. But it wasn't a story I was willing to tell. I was willing to walk in. But now, I am. I can't be quiet. Jesus didn't have a story of change in his personal life. He didn't have a story of, of transformation. He didn't need transformation. But we read and we hear his stories in the Bible. And those stories are a catalyst for change and transformation in our lives. Which ultimately result in a testimony. So I want to look at three examples today. Of people with really great stories and really great testimonies who encountered Jesus. The first one is this woman at the well. You guys have heard that story before, right? Jesus meets a Samaritan woman at the well, just drawing water, right? And Jesus encounters her, says, hey, would you give me some of that water? The woman's shocked. Can you even talk to me? You're Samaritan. I'm Samaritan. You're a Jew. Can, can we even be seen here together? And Jesus talks to her and says, hey, listen, I can give you the water that will cause you to never thirst again. I am the one who God sent. I've come for you. I know all the things you've done in your life, but I'm here for you. And what we know is in John chapter 4, after this encounter, look at what happens in verse 27. It says this, just then his disciples, Jesus' disciples came back. They were shocked to find him talking to this woman, right? But none of them had the nerve to ask why. What do you want with her or, or why are you talking to her? 
Verse 28, the woman left her water jar beside the well, and what she do? She ran back to the village telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. Folks, let me tell you, if you have a testimony, a real testimony in your life of Jesus transforming you, of Jesus bringing you out of something, Jesus bringing you into something, a real testimony, you will share it and you won't stop. Period. Another example we find in Mark chapter 1, Jesus heals a man with leprosy. And, and he does this crazy thing. And in verse 40, we see the story. A man with leprosy came and knelt in front of Jesus, begging to be healed. If you are willing, you can heal me and make me clean, this man said. Move with compassion. Jesus reached out and touched him. I am willing, he said. And Jesus said, be healed. And instantly the leprosy disappeared, and the man was healed. Then Jesus sent him on his way with a stern warning. Get this. He just said, hey, don't tell anyone about this. Instead, go to the priest and let him examine you. Take along the offering required in the law of Moses for those who have been healed of leprosy. This will be a public testimony that you have been cleansed. But look at what happens in verse 45. But the man went and spread the word, proclaiming to everyone what had happened. Jesus said, don't tell, every, don't, don't tell anybody. Keep it a secret for now. He had some reasons for that. But the man said, I can't. I got to tell people. And he went and he told everybody. Who are you telling your story to? Have you experienced the life change in your life? Have, have you experienced something like this? If you have, you won't be quiet. You can't keep it under wraps. I mean, really, can you blame the guy? If you understood the disease of leprosy, which is basically like your skin falling off, you are an outcast, outcast in society. Like, we don't even understand what an outcast is in society compared to this guy. And he went and told everybody, this man, Jesus, he healed me. One more story. Jesus heals a, a blind man in John chapter 9. And in verse 1, it says this. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. Rabbi, his disciples asked him, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? Verse 3, look at what Jesus says. Oh, I like this. It was not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. Wow. What a perspective. This statement has big implications for us, folks. Jesus is saying here that this guy who was born blind, he, he was born this way so God could tell a greater story. He encountered this affliction, this difficulty. Can you imagine what it's like to be blind? And it wasn't anybody's fault, but God did it on purpose. He's telling a greater story. You know, understand, folks, we, we can blame God for the hurtful wounds that we've experienced if we want to. And the reality is when things happen to us, especially things that are outside of our control, we, we go to that pretty quick, don't we? God, why? God, God, why? Why did you let this happen? And it's a valid question, and I don't think God is afraid of that question. Matter of fact, Job asked that question. If you want to see God's answer to that, go read Job chapter 40 and a few more chapters after that, and God answers Job. But God can handle those why questions. But understand this. It's not God's fault that hurtful things happen to you. It's not. God never desired sin to enter into this earth. And it's only because of sin that hurtful things happen to us. God's mentality, the, his, his kingdom will, his kingdom mentality is that none of us should ever go through hurt. None of us should ever go through pain. None of us should ever go through death. 
But the reality is the, the result of this sinful world, we walk and we live in pain and we live in death and we experience that. And that does happen. And I know it's hard to understand, but understand that the God that we serve understands how you feel. And when your heart breaks, his heart breaks too. He gets it. He doesn't desire that for you. But maybe when those things happen to us, those things that we don't like, that thing that just won't go away, that, that, that thought pattern, that addiction that we're struggling in, the thing that caused that addiction, the reason why we're self-medicating in a sense, maybe we should acknowledge that God is up to something in those things. Like he was in this story with a blind man. God is the greatest author that's ever written a story. Better than name your favorite author. God is the greatest author. And I love what this man says after Jesus heals him and takes away his blindness. And this story unfolds in John 9, verse 25. This man's question about what happened to him. We knew you were blind, but all of a sudden you're not. And look at what he says in verse 25 of John 9. Talking about Jesus, he says, I don't really know who the guy is. I don't know if he's a sinner, the man replied. But I know this, I was blind, but now I can see. But what did he do, they asked. How did he heal you? Look, the man exclaimed, I've already told you. I'll keep telling you over and over again, but didn't you listen? Why do you want me to hear it? Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? And they cursed him and said, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses, a bunch of haters. We know God spoke to Moses. We don't even know where this man came from. This guy said, I don't know. I can't explain it to you. I don't know what happened. All I know is I encountered Jesus, and I was blind, and now I can see. And I'm not going to shut up about it. If you, wanna, if you want me to keep repeating it, fine. If you don't, I'm going to keep repeating it anyways. I will never quit telling this story. Here, here's another question for you. Maybe it's a dumb question. Maybe it's not. I don't know, but I'm going to ask you anyways. Could the reason you don't have a good story to tell be because you haven't encountered God in your inmost, darkest places? You haven't encountered Jesus in those places. You haven't trusted God enough to be vulnerable and to be open with him or with others. I think for a lot of us, the story's incomplete because we refuse to let God into those areas. We refuse to let God heal. We refuse to let God do his work. I challenged you last week to begin to write out your story, to write your autobiography, the good things, the bad things. And I want you to just understand this, that in writing your story down, whether you type it, you hand it out, whatever you do, in the writing of your autobiography, as you take time to think through your life, as you write down the pain and the struggles you faced in your life, there's a powerful thing that happens. And I've seen it happen in my own life. Your story begins to turn around. It just happens that way. Your life, your relationships begin to turn around. This writing of your story is a catalyst. It's the beginning of your story becoming a good story. It is a pivotal point. It is a turning point in your life when you do this. Folks, good stories, good testimonies, they don't happen by accident. You know, we, we crave control, don't we? we? We want control of everything. And the one thing we can control, a lot of times we don't. You can control how you respond to a situation in your life. You can control how you've responded to a wound, to a hurt. You can control. You can build your story and build your testimony however you want. Rick, you can build your bridge and get over it. You can build your bridge and get over it. It's up to you. Take ownership. Take responsibility. The building of your bridge is your testimony. What are you going to do with the things in your life, the struggles? I've given you a tangible thing to do, to start. I've told you, write your story. Write your autobiography. There's more things coming. 
But do that and watch God work. I promise you he will work in this. If I didn't share this last verse, it'd be a shame. So I want to do this as we close today. Revelation 12, verse 11. The New King James Version says it this way. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. It's a powerful statement. Let me ask you a question. Would you share your story if your life depended on it? In early Christianity, as the faith was beginning to grow, also martyrdom was on the rise. People getting killed for their faith, for the story, for the transformation that took place in their life, those things, that, that was becoming more and more prevalent. Haters tried to stop the spreading of God's word, but people would not quit sharing their stories, their testimonies, even to the point of death. In this passage that I've just read, this Revelation 12, 11, the context of this verse, most believe it's the end times. And I know that for me personally, we're getting close to that. And what this is saying is that there's going to come a time where you're going to have to make a choice. Either you're going to be transformed by God and you're going to be unashamed to tell that story. And there's a possibility that, that, that you're going to die for that, okay? Especially as we draw closer to the end. Or you're not. Will you share your story? If your life depended on it, number one, would you have a real story to share? And would you share it if it meant you would die. It's a tough topic to think about. But understand, this is what I love about this author, this great storyteller, who is God our Father. We feel like death is a loss. But like the farmer said, death, good or bad? We think about death as, as bad, but we understand this, that the God that we serve says, death has lost its sting. Paul said, it's better. It's better. I would prefer to be away from the body to be in heaven with my father. That's my preference. Understand that. Wow. Death, good or bad. A testimony is a powerful thing, folks. You need one. Maybe you have one right now, but it's incomplete. What's keeping you from building your bridge? And getting over it. From taking the practical steps that you need to do. The things you need to do to be able to set free. And to get healing in your life. From the things that, that have entangled you for so very long. What is keeping you from that? As we bow our head and close our eyes this morning. For some of us the very thing. That's keeping us from, from dealing with the stuff in our life. That we know we need to deal with. It's time. Time. Because the reality is, if you're going to get past those things, if you're going to have a testimony and a story worth telling, it's going to take some time. It's going to take a sacrifice. It's not just going to happen by accident. So many times I encounter people who are in trauma, traumatic events, the relationship is broken. What are we going to do? And when they understand that, that there's no magic fix, there's no magic cure, that it's going to take some time, they're out. I, I, don't, I don't have time. Folks, there's nothing more important in your life, in this world, I don't care what it is, than dealing with this stuff right now. Time. You have time. For some of us, the issue is pride. Well, this is good, preacher. I, lo I love hearing your story. Man, I'm excited about that. Good for you. I'm good. You're not good. You're not anywhere close to being good. You are not good. You don't have your life together. I don't have my life totally together. We all have things in our lives that we need to deal with. And if we don't, they'll continue affecting us. The enemy will use your pride against you. 
and it will keep you from being set free from those things. The single most dangerous statement you could say, I'm good. For some of us, the reason why we refuse to deal with the things in our life that, that's just entangling us and messing us up all the time is because we are afraid of going back into that thing. We're afraid of what's there. We know that back there, we're going to have to come face to face. We're going to have to come turn with some really painful stuff. And you feel like, you know, I've kind of moved on past that. But the reality is, you know that you haven't. And so if I open up that wound again, if I go there and deal with that, it's just going to make things worse. I'm going to fall back into whatever I was in. Folks, that's a lie. Don't be afraid. If you're a believer in Christ, you don't have the spirit of fear. That's not a spirit that comes from the Lord. Would you encounter God in this place in your life, wherever that is? Would you not be afraid to encounter him today? Maybe there's somebody in here this, this morning that would say, you know, I'll never truly have, a, have, have had a real encounter with Jesus in my life. I need to meet him, really, really meet him. I need to know him today for the first time. I have that desire. And if that's you in this room, very simply, all you've got to do is ask Christ to come into your life. Tell him where you sit, that you understand that you need him. You understand the sacrifice he made for you on the cross and that he rose again and ask him to come into your life ask him to change you and he will change you he will give you a fresh start he will renew your life you will be able to walk in have the potential to experience the full life the abundant life that we find on the other side of the bridge so God would you do work in this place this morning convict us Use these words as a catalyst for change, for good. And I pray that testimonies would be shared of life's change. We ask all these things in Jesus' name.